Welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. To me, being perfect is not about that scoreboard out there. This is a chance of a lifetime. When you can understand the person, you can then work towards a common goal. We are all on the same team. Now you roll and do it to the best of your ability. Focus on the fundamentals. We've gone over time and time again. Your defense has got to be better. Leave no doubt tonight. Great moments are born from great opportunity. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast, where we believe that there is no algorithm for leadership, and so we interview great sports coaches from around the world to try and find ideas to help us all be better leaders. Our great coach on this episode is Dan McKellar. Dan is a former rugby union player and now coach. He played more than 150 Premier Grade Games at South's Rugby Club in Brisbane, Australia, winning a premiership with them in 2000. He started coaching as a player coach at Wicklow in Ireland in 2002, before becoming the head coach of his old side, South's Rugby Club, in 2008. He then became head coach for the Tuggeranong Vikings Rugby in 2011 and won back-to-back premierships with them. In 2018, he became head coach of the Brumbies in the Super Rugby competition and led them to the 2020 Super Rugby Australian Premiership. In 2021, he became an assistant coach for the Australian Wallabies and then in 2022 was announced as the head coach for the Leicester Tigers in the UK. Dan has a nice balance between the science and art of coaching. And in this terrific interview, some of the key highlights for me were his view on the importance of life balance and how he has added this to the trademarks he looks for in his coaching group. How the time you invest with each individual in an organisation will mean a lot to them and strengthen their connection to the organisation. And and how great leaders are separated from the rest by understanding that at times they will have to make decisions that reduce their popularity. This was a great conversation and I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. And just before we go to the interview, if you like what we do here on the podcast, then head over to our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com. There you will find loads of exclusive audio and video content that you can download and share with your friends, family and teammates to bring a different context to the challenges that you might be facing. And now, please enjoy our interview with Dan McKellar. You're listening to The Great Coaches Podcast. Dan McKellar, good morning and welcome to The Great Coaches Podcast. Morning, Paul. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me, mate. It's nice to uh, nice to finally connect and and get here after a couple of months of toing and froing. Yes, I've chased you through Europe. I chased you into Japan and now here he is. I've got you in your in your garage up there in well, I won't tell people where you are. I'll ask Thank the question. You. Where are you in the world, Dan? Tell me what have you been doing so far today? Uh, currently based in, in Brisbane, um, in, uh, in Queensland, uh, in Australia, obviously. And, and I'm just in, uh, in my house and I've got this little downstairs area that I've managed to turn into a little bit of a man cave or teenagers retreat, depending on who needs it, um, where I can do my work or sit on the couch and, and watch a bit of footy or TV or, or do a bit of training if I, uh, if, if I want to. So that's no, a good little space and. It's got polished concrete on the floor here, which is good because, as we know, mate, Queensland is hot, and especially at this time of year. So it keeps it that little bit cooler and makes sure that uh, makes sure that I'm nice and comfortable to sit here and uh, and have a really good discussion with yourself, mate. Dan, I'm going to start by just name checking a couple of the very good coaches that you've been a been a been able to work with. There's Steve Larkham, World Cup winning Jake White, and of course recently Dave Rennie. I'm sure there's been many, many others that you've uh, had chance to work with along your journey. But as you've seen these people up close and you've watched them work, what is it you think the great ones do differently that sets them apart? Yeah, it's a re- it's a really good question because they are they are all uh, very different. You know, as well, we're human beings at the end of the day, aren't we? We're as coaches, and as we know, the, we're all we're all different, but. I think that the common traits or common themes amongst the really good coaches, firstly, are that they're generally very curious people. They want to know why you do things. They want to know how. Um, 
they want to know the what and potentially when. Um, and they've basically they've got a really strong thirst for for learning and and wanting to get better and better every day. And I think that's that's a trait that most good coaches have. And obviously they'll pass it on to their onto their players and, and onto their staff. Um, I think now as well with this, you know, with the different gener- generation generational player, um, there's a real really strong emphasis on on care and, and, and connection with your with with your players as, as well as your staff. Um, and I think if you if you've got that and and your your people know that the, that's genuine, um, then that's a really strong trait to to have. But at the same time, you, you need to be honest and and you need to be direct and, and upfront. Um, you know, we can't be sugarcoating things and it's not always going to be an arm around approach or, or that carrot approach. Sometimes you're going to need to be uh, direct and a little bit blunt and, 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 and produce a little bit of stick at times, but that's, that's coaching and that's the environment. That's leadership, isn't it? Leadership isn't always uh, the most popular uh, thing to do. And I think that that separates the, the great leaders from, um, from the, the not so great is that they understand that, at times you've got to make decisions and 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 be the person that um isn't necessarily going to be the most popular in the room. Well, from the great coaches all the way back to when you started and you were playing in Ireland with Wicklow, or when you became a, a playing coach, what do you remember most interesting? What do you remember finding most fascinating when you started coaching back in those days? Yeah, it was certainly it was an eye opener. Um because you know, I, I got that job out of the blue. A mate of mine was the previous player coach, and he was coming towards the end of his career, and he just sent out an email saying who, who'd be interested. And I, I said, "Well, I certainly would be." I just missed missed out on a contract with the Reds as a player, um, so I got in touch with the club, and they said, "Oh, you're too young. You're only 25. You can't be coaching our 35 year olds, 36 year olds." Um, we'd love to have you as a player. I said, well, if, I, if I'm not coming as a player coach, I'm, I'm not coming. So in the end, we, we come to an agreement and I went over there as as uh, as player coach. And I think I, I learned the importance over there of having connection with my players, but at the same time, or well, the same stage, un- understanding that uh, as the coach, you need to be able to step away. And, and, and when you can, uh, after a game or after a win, uh, enjoy a beer with the boys um, and, and and relax, but then understand that there needs to be balance within that. And when 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 is the time to to sort of pull away and and understand that there, there needs to be some separation at that particular moment. Um, I learned very early on that you've got to be incredibly detailed. You've got to be incredibly well organised uh, and and planned because remember that I was a player, so I had to do a lot of the training with. With with the group as well, so that was a, that was a really important uh, you know learning for me was being planned, being detailed, being organised, knowing within my session plan this was this was when I was required to coach, and this was when I was required to um to 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 just be a player, and I think leading through my actions uh, that that was that was the big thing. It, I, I could never be a do as you know do as I say, not as I do. Um, player coach, you, you lose the respect of the group really quickly, and and I just had to front up and and and, and lead through my actions, and and I think um, early on, um, you know, I remember it was it was amateur footy. Um, I had a real focus on on discipline and, and 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 getting the team fitter than they ever had been, and I thought that if we did that, then then we'd win games early on off the back of being everyone understanding their role and everyone being fitter than they ever had been and, and being fitter than the opposition. And and uh, so I had to step in and and lead the way and make sure that I turned up in pretty good physical condition to um, to ensure that I was setting a good example for, for my team. Dan, Laurie Fisher, when he was reflecting on you, he said, Dan has the three A's, an aptitude for coaching, an appetite for learning and ambition. You see all three in a young coach, you're prepared to spend time with them. And it was the aptitude thing that caught my eye. And I'm wondering what early experiences in your life helped shape your aptitude for coaching and therefore leadership? Yeah, that's. Um, I, I think I've, I've naturally had a love um, 
for coaching, to be honest. I, I think I was probably born to be a coach and in my initial days, it was I was always really fascinated by by rugby league. You know, I was a North Queensland boy. Um, my, my dad was a rugby league player. Um, you know, I grew up around the, this the sport. My parents were publicans. We'd sponsored the local rugby league team. Um, so I always had a real fascination around statistics and and looking at the game a little bit deeper than probably most kids would. But so I think that love uh, for coaching has been there from day one and, and you know, whether that was uh, under 13s at, at Townsville Grammar, the school I went to, whether it was coaching Wicklow, Souths, uh, the Tuggeranong Vikings, it's been there from, from day one. So I think when you, when you love, when you genuinely love something that, that, that helps and it makes it that whole much, much more easier than, than I suppose it is for, for people who are considering it just as a career or, or something to help pay the bills and, so I've always had a thirst for knowledge and, and I've always had a thirst for detail. And I think when I first started coaching at Souths at senior level in Australia, I wanted to be quickly become a coach that, say, Quade Cooper, um, when he returned from the Reds and came back to play for, for Souths, that he was coming back to a coach or, or an environment who could help him get better um, at, at a level where he probably wasn't thinking that would happen. Now, that, that certainly wasn't the case early on in, in my coaching career. You know, I'll be honest, I wasn't going to teach Quaid a whole lot um, back in 2007, 2008. But from an early stage, I sort of worked out that um, you had to work really hard to constantly look for ways to increase your knowledge uh, and your detail on the game in all areas. And I think the move for me uh, to Tuggeranong after Souths really helped um, that develop, where I was all of a sudden – coaching at semi-professional level, but I was, I was in a full-time role. Uh, I wasn't selling orthopedic implants anymore. I was, I was just being a coach. So I had um, all day, every day to uh, increase my own knowledge uh, and thirst for, for detail and, and clear understanding. I developed relationships with your Steve Larkhams, your Jake Whites, your Laurie Fishers and Lisa Alexander from, uh, from Netball Australia, from the Diamonds and, um, I, I've always had that, um, I suppose, that curiosity around how am I going to make myself get better um, every day and how can I help my players get better? Dan, one of the fascinating things about your story, and you alluded a bit to it there, is you've coached all over the place, Sydney, Queensland, and then you've been to Scotland, Ireland, Japan, Australia, and you've got England coming up. Yeah. How has this experience influenced the way you communicate with people? Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Look, I, I think with, um, with, with any given sort of area or team or, or, uh, or culture that you, that you're coaching, I think what I've learned over time is that regardless of the heritage of a player, everyone's different. You, you can't treat every player the same. And I think different players need different things. And now how I would treat, um, James Slipper. To, to to Nick White, you know, for example, would be would be very different and be very different to to Rob Velatini again. And I just think coaching nowadays, even when I first started coaching uh, in Australia, you, you, your group is is very different. You know, like when I was at the Brumbies, I had um, a squad that was probably fifty percent of Pacifica background, uh, Polynesian background, and and great boys to coach, um, but. but uh, having an understanding of, of what makes them work or what makes Scott Seo work or Rob Velatini, Len uh, is, is very different to, um, what would have made Quade Cooper work or, or Van Humphreys work at Souths or, or, or as I said, um, James Slipper, very, very different. So, um, your approach to each individual needs to be, needs to be different re- regardless of, of 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 where you might be coaching, and I think um, understanding that that's that that that's so key. We're human beings; we're all very very different. Um, who do you put an arm around to help get the best out of them? You know who who can who can who can deal with uh, blunt direct feedback, or or, or who needs to be um, treated in a different way to help? Because I think as a coach, you're always thinking, how do I get the best out of my people? Um, and if you just have a, a, a one size fits all, then it's 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 not go- it's not going to work. It'll it'll certainly never work. And and I've learnt that um, 
through all of my experiences as a coach, wherever it might be in the world or, or within Australia. With so many people on the playing list, let alone support staff, how do you get to the point where you can have that innate understanding of an individual to understand what they need? It must be very difficult. And I, th- I think that's where connection's critical. Um, you, you, you've, you've got to spend time in, investing in, in, in the individuals. And that's, that's difficult uh, because each, each individual um, player has themselves to worry about, really, from one day to the next. When you're a head coach, you've got 40 to 50 players to worry about. You've got 25 staff. You've got sponsors. You've got media. There's so many different roles uh, that, that are required. So, but what you've got to understand is, is the, the time that you give that particular person um, is going to mean so much to them uh, as an individual. And, and for them to feel like you genuinely care about them, uh, and it's not necessarily you know, caring is not just saying good day to them uh, in, in the hallways. It's, it's investing in them, making sure that they feel like if they're having an issue off the field, that they can pick up the phone and uh, and give you a call. You know what I mean? If, if if they feel that it's important for you to know, and and I think once you've got that relationship with your players and with your staff, someone will come and knock on your door, or you know, I'm, I'm having issues with my relationship, or um, you know, uh, there might be illness within the family, or whatever it might be, or, or they've just bought a house. You know, you might be celebrating something. Uh, I think once you've got that within your relationships with your people then then you know that you're in a really good place and where do you get that feeling of care from that sustains you um yeah i i I think it's it's probably what like what i just spoke about there in terms of and you 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 do need to reflect and have those thoughts so what what's what's going to make me me feel better what's going to make me feel like i belong um to this to this team to this to this to this organization i think um you know you get that from your own leaders as well i know certainly at the brumbies phil thompson was the ceo there um you know someone who'd always just check in on uh on, on how how i was doing um how my family would be doing how my daughters had settled into high school whatever it might be what were they up to in sport and uh, and just know, and just knowing that it's re- that it's really genuine, I think that's 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 critical. And, and it all comes back to just feeling like you belong within that particular room or or environment or team or or organisation. And, and I think once you've got that, then you can just be yourself. You can be yourself as a as a human being. And and we all know, you know, it's no like we're most comfortable in our own homes. Why are we most comfortable in our own homes? Because we know we can be ourselves with our with our, with our wives, with our partner, with, with our kids, whoever, whoever it may be. Dan, you took over the Brumbies in 2018. And then in 2020, you win the Super Rugby AU Grand Final just a couple of short years later. What were some of the first things you did when you took over the Brumbies that drove that result? Yeah, it's um, at the end of 2017. We, we were a group that, um, and look, the Brumbies still cop a bit for it, a bit of flack for it. We were very heavily reliant on on field. We were reliant on mall um, and structure um, with it, within our game. We were a very structured sort of team, so um, we weren't scoring enough tries. And, and look, that was that was something that we needed to. We needed to change and and, uh, and address. Um, so at the end of 2017, um, you know, I came up with a vision um, along with my coaching staff that we, we needed to be able to score tries. We needed to be more threatening from from unstructured scenarios, and for that to happen, we had to invest in in other areas of our game. We still wanted to maintain what we were good at, uh, but we had to develop and from counter attack, uh, from turnover attack. Uh, for us to compete with the Crusaders, the Blues, the Hurricanes, the Chiefs, uh, we needed to invest time in these particular areas, and and that was uh, that was a real challenge because we'd had players that had come through the Jake White uh, era that had sort of continued on to Steve Larkham's first stint, 
as head coach. So they were used to doing things a, a particular way and asking senior players in their thirties who've been who've done it for over a hundred games to do something different was quite uh, was quite challenging. But look, they wanted to. There was a real buy-in and a thirst for it. But we didn't start the season my first year, 2018. We had a poor start. We didn't start well. And it was uh, a really interesting time for me in my coaching career um, from a very early stage as a head coach at a professional level anyway that am I going to continue to believe in this vision and stay true to it um, and understand that we'll need to push through some tough times here or... Do you revert back to, right, oh, we've lost four out of the first six. We'll revert back to what we used to do. Um, and that's probably something that I'm most proud of is that we did stick to it. Um, the group stuck tight. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have the uh, micro chat conversations where people were blaming the coach or blaming other players or blaming the vision or that sort of thing. We, we really did stay true to it and we pushed through it and, I think in the end we developed into a into a team that was a much more balanced team. Um, we were still good at structure, but but we were a team that could uh, hurt you at mall, but also hurt you in uh, in uh, in other areas. And and then I think off the field, I wanted to be. Uh, we always had this name or you know reputation as a team that had uh, had a great environment or a great culture. But if you walked into the new facility at, at uh, the University of Canberra and you were new to the Brumbies environment, did you really know what we what we lived and breathed and what we stood for as an organisation and and we didn't. So we developed um, our own values, uh, our own pillars and, and and what we thought was our own DNA within the, within the group and, and that still stands there uh, now and it's referred to uh, still today and, and, and from uh, from one meeting to the next, which is which is, you know, something off field that um, uh, I'm proud of as well. Yeah, and I want to ask you about those uh, trademarks, or as you described them, that DNA. But if I could just wind back a little bit, when you were, when you had lost those four of those first six, and the doubt was setting in, was there any particular event? Was there something that just gave you that jolt of belief, or was it more of a just gr- a gradual process based on everyone around you? Um. There, there was a particular game, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. But it was within the games that we'd lost. There, there, there were moments within that game where you could see what we trained so hard, what we were working on, what we were trying to develop. You, you could see moments of it, and and there'd, there'd be, you know, we'd have passages of of, of really, um, you know, brilliant play with a lot of skill and. And just different pitches to what we'd been used to with the with the Brumbies, um, you know, over the, the previous sort of six or seven years. Um, so there was enough that I was seeing within games to to, as I say, to to believe in what I was doing and 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 stick and stick tight to the vision. That we had to go to South Africa. We played the Melbourne Rebels one night in 2018, and we were well and truly in front. They stormed home over the top of us. We got a few injuries. Anyway, it was a really disappointing dressing shed and we went to South Africa the next day and that was probably the best thing for us at the airport. It was a pretty low, disappointed sort of environment. We weren't excited, I would say, to get to South Africa. Um, But at that particular moment, I started to give the players more responsibility um, around presenting and and, and leading the group. You know, I was obviously still coaching as were the other coaches were, were guiding them. But giving them more responsibility um, for what we were doing, and we went over and we played the Lions in Johannesburg and led for a fair chunk of that game, and then we got a red card. And the Lions were probably the form side at that particular time. We were just beaten in yet Johannesburg, and then the following week uh, we went to uh, a venue where where we could just train, uh, eat, uh, have our meetings. It was just a one stop shop, and we were, we were together. Uh, 24-7 and that really brought us together and and then we went out and played the Bulls in Pretoria that particular week and and beat them with 14 men and again they were in the top three teams in the competition at that particular time coached by John Mitchell chock full of uh, uh, Springboks and it was just a great game it was probably the making of players like Tom Banks and after that game I, I, I remember thinking to myself and talking to the coaches about it We'll look back on on this moment as um, as the as the moment where this where this team 
started to really find confidence and, and belief in 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 what we were doing. Dan, could I ask you about these? I've I've heard you refer to them as trademarks, and and they are connected with the different positions within the team. I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on that for us a little bit. Yeah, so within our team room at the Brumbies, um, in each position, we came up with um, five five things for each position that we thought was was critical um, for a, a prop, a lock, a winger, whatever it might be. To know it was really important uh, from from a coaching point of view, or from an organisational point of view, what was important for them to produce week in week out and. And where where I think that it helped us was and helped the players was was in and around selection. And I would use the trademarks as a guide for for selection. Uh, they'd be displayed. They were there. They are obvious for everyone to see. So a tight forward, for for example, would know that um, world class set piece and and physicality and repeat efforts are the two or three most important things for him to produce. Uh, for him to get in the team and and stay in the team at the Brumbies from one week to the next, uh, a winger would have an understanding that um, that we'd celebrate and reward effort that requires no, absolutely no talent um, for effort on on chasing kicks um, to to turn an average kick into uh, into a very good kick just off the back of. Of, of that particular effort, understanding what was important to us, but then making sure as a coach or as a coaching group that that we constantly referred to those particular trademarks and that we celebrated celebrated them being done well and never ne- never veering too too far away from them in terms of our messaging. I think what was in the trademarks really linked in with what was our DNA, I suppose, or what was our identity as uh, as a team or as a club at the Brumbies. And it was pretty easy if, if a player um, wasn't producing uh, the trademarks on a consistent basis. Um, it was an easy discussion around, around selection or if they didn't value them or didn't see the importance of them. But also uh, gave us a guide from a coaching perspective as well as that, okay, this, this player is really good at these three or four things. We need him to chip away at this particular area here, and it's on us and, and on the player to 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 be accountable for that and take response responsibility to get better in in uh, in that particular area. Did those trademarks extend to the coaching group? Uh, yeah, yeah, look, I, I think our, our trademarks uh, was were certainly around uh, work, work ethic, um, detail. Uh, planning and and uh, simplicity of message. I think they would be they they would be the trademarks that we certainly lived lived and breathed as as a coaching team. And I think over the last couple of years, I've learned that the the other thing that needs to be added into that is is balance, um, is life balance, and um, and looking after yourself and remembering what's important. As I said, you're not going to go too far as a coach if if you don't love what you're doing and when you love to do something, it's it's easy to to consume yourself with it and do it 24-7. Um, but are you, you know, focusing on what's most important, your family? Are you getting to your daughter's primary school uh, graduation? Are you going to watch her play uh, touch footy or, or a netball game that's really important to her? And um, are you taking the wife out for, for dinner, um, listening to her? Experiences from her life, uh, from her from her work life, and and making sure that you've got that uh, got that balance because at the end of the day, they're the most important people to you. And I think that that balance helps re-energize you. And when you walk back in the door the following day or the following morning, as a group and as a as a coaching group, you're much more re-energized, much more refreshed, and and the players feel that if you're tired, dragging yourself around the the um, uh, the building. Then that'll uh, that'll sap energy from the players and certainly rub off on them. Instead of it being the other way, we should be an energy provider. Dan, I've heard you talk on numerous occasions about the importance of having good people around you as a head coach. Now, I know a lot of people will say that staff of everything and, and good people are the cent- central part of the business. But I wanted to flip it around actually and ask you: What does having good staff around you 
allow you to do better as a head coach? Yeah, it's it's like for, for most people, it's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? But it's it's just so difficult to to um, to to get quality people uh, around you. You know, it's easier e- easier said than done. And and you know, until you actually start working with uh, particular people, you're never really going to know. Uh, are they the right fit for 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 your coaching group? Are they the right fit for for the team? For the organisation, but I, I think when when you get it right, and if you've done your due diligence with your recruitment, um, and also your attention, it just it allows you to trust your staff, and then that allows you to do your job really well. Um, I think importantly, it allows you to to delegate um, with with real confidence, um, knowing that whatever task it may be, that it's that, it, that it's being done well. I don't think anyone likes being micromanaged. I don't think anyone likes micromanaging. Um, and if you've got quality people around you, then that allows uh, that allows for for micromanaging to to be something that doesn't exist within your within your coaching group, your staff group. Um, if you're having to double check or triple check things um, that that people are doing, um, then that's taking away important time from you as a head coach. It's not allowing you to focus on what's most important and. And that's one-on-ones with players, checking in on your staff, managing your people, managing up, making sure that you're uh, spending time with 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 your CEO, with the general manager, um, with the board, um, making sure that sponsors are happy because sponsors want time with you as well. The media, all these sorts of things, and obviously, you know, overall your your environment and and, and your culture within within your own team. Um, I'm always going to be a coach that wants to coach on, on the grass, and, and I think that's that's important. It's getting harder and harder because there's so much that goes into uh, to being a head coach as compared to the very different role of being an assistant coach. But um, you've got to trust your people, uh, and to do that, you've got to take the time to do your due diligence and be really thorough in making sure that you're not only getting the right skill set, you're getting the right character um, to, to join your staff group. And it might be sometimes you've got two people who are the right skill set. Um, one person's more of an introvert. One person's more of a an, an extrovert, an energy provider. What is what does your group need? Your group might need an introvert, someone who's just going to go about his his job and, and and do his task really well. And then you might, or you might need a bigger personality um, to to have the balance right. Because if we've got five Dan McCallers, then that's that's not going to be a whole lot of fun for. Um, for uh, for anyone, is it? So I think that balance within your within your group is is so important. Coaching team, not just head coach. Everyone, the head coach will get all the praise so often um, for wins, uh, and, and he'll also cop a hiding if there's a few losses uh, on the trot as well. But um, the head coach can't do it all on his own. It, it all comes back to your coaching team and, and your group of staff. Well, just picking up on that theme of the head coach not being able to do it all themselves, when it comes to developing leaders within the team, players, staff, whatever that may be, have you found anything that works better than other things? Uh, yeah, I, I have. I, I think, see, I'm, I'm a big believer that um, leaders are born. I think there's born leaders. You see kids as a ten year old, and you see the leaders within any within any uh, group, um, e- even at primary school, might be just uh, a young bloke organising a-, a gathering with his mates, come around and watch the grand final, or watch the Brumbies play, or watch the Wallabies play, wh- whoever it might be. I think you see those leadership qualities in in, in people uh, early. Um, I think a big thing with leadership for me is. Putting them in a position to lead and enable leadership. Um, otherwise, you could have five or six great leaders within your group, but if you're never allowing them to actually lead, if it's always going to be coach-driven or, or you know that that teaching style uh, environment, then how are they going to grow and, and and develop as as leaders and 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 ultimately become better in in that area themselves, and then. Uh, make others better as well. I think I think that's really important. Look, we, we've done in the past 
um, you know, more formal things like your 360 degree um, surveys or, or, or whatever you want to refer to it as, where um, staff and, and leaders um, will get a fair understanding on how they operate as people. Now, uh, does all of that necessarily help? Maybe not, but are there certain uh, little bits of gold that you, you pick out of it? And for myself, a, a really important part after doing a, a 360 degree um, survey on myself was just that self awareness. Um, and I think that's, that's massive. Like understanding what are you going to revert to or default to under pressure and under stress. Um, and, and knowing that about yourself and, Righto, he's going to get a little bit wound up when he's when he's under stress or pressure. Okay, now I'm aware of that. I can feel that uh, coming on. I've got to take a breath. Don't say what what I might have said a couple of years ago. Don't hold back. Sleep on it. Think about it. Then deliver the message that you want to deliver in a much clearer uh, headspace or or mindset. And I, I think that that self awareness is uh, is is a massive part of leadership. And then obviously. Once you've put them in a position to lead, is um, providing them with feedback. I'd meet with my leaders every Monday morning. The first thing we'd uh, talk about is uh, leadership opportunities. Um, have we? What are examples of them from the previous week? Um, how did we go about showing leadership in that particular example? And were there also examples that we missed? And we. We just let slide, and and um, and and why did we do that? Um, make sure we're aware of that, and 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 make sure that we don't miss that opportunity uh, the next time. Do you find that there's a pattern in the things that get left to slide within teams? Yeah, oh, I've certainly I've certainly seen it, and and often it's just it's the it's the little things, it's the little things that are let slide within teams that then uh, add up um, over a day, over a week, over a month, over a year, and all of a sudden your environment is is uh, is, is pretty average. of have 100% um, exp- experienced that, and that's why, um, you know, generally the, the big issues within any, any team or organisation will be dealt with, you know, where the media might be involved or whatever, and look at the Brumbies of, Never had to do, deal with any major off-field uh, off-field issues, but it's the little uh, examples of cutting corners off the field, which then lead to cutting corners on the field. Um, an off-field example might be leaving your cup, your dirty cup, or your dirty dishes in the sink, leaving your Mount Franklin water bottle lying around in the team room, um, thinking that uh, your time's more important than someone else's. And someone else will come along and collect that, and then that leads into you might be doing a walkthrough or jog through on field, and we've gone to a wide breakdown. There's no pressure; we're just jogging through, and you've just stood up or you know hunched over that breakdown in really poor position, not practicing great habits constantly, and then on Saturday night, there's a wide breakdown. What's the, the muscle memory? Uh, is all about the poor example that you've had at training or you've had uh, at training over a, over a period of time. That transfers all of a sudden. We're turning the ball over or throwing a line out poorly or, or haven't worked hard enough because we just assume that the guy inside me or the guy outside me would do the, would do the work for me. I'm a big believer that off-field discipline well and truly links into uh, on-field discipline. I'm going to pick up this idea of uh, what you do off field influencing what you do on field and i'd like to uh, start it with a quote actually from you dan you say the key for me is at 7 45 on saturday night is that you run onto the field and your headspace and mindset is so clear that you can just go out and do what you do naturally and perform your role well and what i wanted to ask you was do you have any routines you use during the week to help you have the right mindset on Saturday night. Yeah, I, I, I certainly do. Um, you know, I've, I've, I'll have a to do list uh, every, every day. Um, I'll, I'll write a to do list or update it um, from from one day to the next, and I think that's that's that, that's really important. I think I just feel 
Um, if you've got things buzzing through your head, uh, it can be overwhelming. But just write it down. Write it down. It's got like right. I've got thirteen. I've got thirteen things I need to do here. Um, what needs to be done now? Prioritize that thirteen. Uh, circle it. Whatever it might be. And I think once you've done that, then all of a sudden, it's a whole relief of uh, of stress or, or, or pressure on yourself. So, um, knowing what I need to do on Sunday to get myself right uh, for, for Monday. Uh, what do I need to do Monday to ensure we're ready to go Tuesday? And, and it's just to flow on. Um, exercise is is important. Uh, I think that, that's that, that's that's really important. I find it to be an outlet. Um, you know, it's it clears your mind, allows you to think with a little bit more creativity, gets the positive endorphins flowing. Um, I think that exercise is 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 the greatest drug on the planet. You know what I mean? It's the more and more you do it, the more you want to do it, the more the better you feel about yourself, both physically and uh, and both uh, and, and mentally as well um and uh, like uh, it's the same with the players sports s- mental skills or sports psychology is something that's uh, in rugby union is still well and truly under underused or undervalued and um generally it's an area that teams that are struggling with budget and that sort of thing it's one of the first things to to go but um i place huge importance on it um, and, and value on it and so much of it is just about um, educating and understanding uh, educating our players the understanding of of routine what do you need to do um, to um, to get yourself ready on Sunday to be ready to go Monday and then tick that list off and be the same from Monday into Tuesday because players need to be educated on what a professional rugby player looks like there's paid rugby players but there's professional rugby players and there's a big, big difference. And the really great teams have have professional rugby players and the, the also rands uh, are, are, are generally made up of mostly mostly paid paid rugby players. Um, and the the other thing from me is is really clear messaging in and around that that quote that you've got there is is making sure that uh, as coaches, as staff, our language, our messaging is is all aligned. If every coach or every staff member has his own different message or uses his own different language, the players have a thousand things going through their head across the line on 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 Saturday night, um, just with a whole heap of noise between the ears. Instead of being really calm and composed and this is exactly what my role is. These are the three things that Dan expects from me or the coaches expect from me. I know that if I get them right, my contribution to the team um, is going to be strong. Collectively, if we do that from 1 to 23, then the uh, the process will certainly look after um, after the outcome that we want. Dan, I know you've got 13 things on your to-do list there, so I might just ask one final question if I could. I know you're still relatively early in your coaching journey. You've already coached in multiple countries and there's um, you're heading off to the UK now to take on one of the powerhouses over there. But when we do look into the future, if you do ever hang up that whistle, what is it you hope the legacy is that you leave with the people that you've, you've led? Yeah, look, uh, I've thought, I've thought about this and I, I I really do hope that my players and staff uh, think that through being coached uh, by me or led by me that I've, I've helped them become better footballers, uh, better at their job, um, but equally or more importantly, just just be better people. Um, I think that's what's most important to me. Um, and for some people, that may take some time to actually realise that. There's probably players now that wouldn't uh, that, that may not think that. But, um, you know, especially when it's an individual that you've had to have some difficult conversations with. But, um, you know, at the time, they, they may not necessarily hear uh, exactly what uh, what I was saying, but within time, they think back and, yeah, maybe he was right. But that's the that's legacy that I want to have is, is that uh, they enjoyed the environment that I created uh, and they felt that they were 
better professionals, better footballers, better physios, better analysts, better coaches, um, but also but also better people. And and look back on the experience really fondly. I think that's that's the legacy that I um, would want to leave. Now, leaving an organisation in a better place than than when I started is is really important. And yeah, I hope I've done that at the Brumbies. Dan, it's been great to spend an hour with you today. I wish you all the best as you head over to the UK. Great place to live, and uh, all of us back home will be watching your trajectory with great interest. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, you know, a real pleasure, Paul, and um, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me on. <laughs> to be honest, it was um, really flattering after seeing some of the guests and the people that you've spoken to to be to be considered uh, someone that you may want to have a chat to. It was um, yeah, it was it was nice to nice to know, and I hope uh, I hope you and the listeners get something out of it. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. You have been listening to the great coach, Dan McKellar. I hope you enjoyed Dan's thoughtful style and found a few ideas that you can bring back to your own team for discussion. When I listened back, some of the other things that resonated with me were how one of the first things he did when he joined the Brumbies was to align everyone on the values that the team lived and breathed. How we are most comfortable in our homes and replicating that feeling in a team helps create a sense of belonging. And how his experience coaching in Scotland, Ireland, Japan and Australia has taught him that your approach to each individual needs to be different if you want to get the best out of them. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And just before we go, if you have any feedback, then please let us know. The messages, notes and interaction with the people around the world who listen keeps us going and gives us a great jolt of energy. And all the details on how to connect with us are in the show notes or on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com.